what better place to visit in the wintertime than Norway? From north to south, it's a nature's lover's paradise. I mean, look at this place. Now, there are a few reasons why I came to Norway. One was to drink whiskey under the northern lights. And two was to visit the northernmost distillery in the world, Aurora Distillery. And lastly, is to learn about whiskey recipe development from my good friends, Benedict and Claudio from Spheric Spirits. You know, one of the things I was always curious about when trying whiskey was, how do they develop recipes? And I'm lucky that I get to learn this today. And I hope you guys enjoy the episode. I'm Jeff. I retired from the military, sold everything I own, and now I'm traveling around the world to learn from brewers, winemakers, distillers, and tell their story. This is my journey of beer, wine, and spirits. Dude, today is the day we get to make whiskey here at Aurora. Meet up with Benedict at Spirit and Spirits. There they are right there. Let's go make some whiskey. Guys. Good morning, everyone. Aha. <laughs> good morning. Oh. Dude, this is a good place to make whiskey right here. Claudio, what's up, buddy? Hey. It all started basically with uh, my passion for culture, how different uh, environments, uh, different cultures use the raw materials, how humanity has tweaked microbiology over the last thousands of years to uh, ferment, make things more digestible, or even create, serve a purpose. Alcoholic beverages or spirits in particular is just a niche. And then eventually uh, Claudio, my old high school friend, who has uh, always been fond of uh, having these adventures with me, discovering uh, different spirits around the world, <laughs> led eventually to us uh, creating a business and financing our passion. So what is your approach for whiskey recipe development? It's not that simple as just a recipe. A recipe in this scenario is understanding every single little component of a production process down to a single digit degree during uh, adding the yeast, for example, or controlling the fermentation throughout, and controlling the temperature throughout. Uh, so it's not just like from A to Z, these are the ingredients that you have to do, it's just you have to understand the entire process and know exactly what's going to happen um, and what tweak. So usually what we do is, all right, what do we actually want to achieve? Looking at this recipe specifically that we're going to create, uh, that we're going to distill, and uh, you know, what was your concept behind it you know where did it start how did the idea come about was it over was it over some whiskey you know in, in scotland that inspired you uh was it you two trying uh you know certain uh, spirits and you guys were like look i would like to replicate that basically started with uh old school scotch uh mold whiskies you know? there's a huge difference between whiskey today and whiskey back then we're not talking about uh, whiskey that has been aged for 30 years compared to one that is only aged 10 years. We're talking about uh, whiskey that has aged the same time in a cask, mm -hmm. but has been produced at a different era. Yeah. So we started to get curious on how this happened. My uh, internship that I did with Thompson Brothers at the Dornock Distillery um, allowed me to taste whiskies that are unreachable to a lot of people and people that I was that I've been talking to that have been drinking Scotch whiskey for a lot of time, complaining that the quality degrades. We always start with tradition, traditional recipe. Then we usually go and dissect, so analytically approaching it, and understand everything about this tradition. Because you can also follow tradition blindly, but we have the scientific spirit to understand it and then we can play with it, but not before that. We play by the rules, but we can still create, or we try to create, a super funky whiskey. And it's still the traditional recipe, just tweaking it a little bit, also sometimes a little bit much to test out the extremes.
if you make whiskey, basically you've got three, three ingredients as well. So grain, water, uh, and yeast. Yeah. Those three are already enough to have a massive spectrum. If we go to the States, when we look at the grain, we've got sweet corn, we've got rye, we've got all these different uh, grains. Every grain has a different flavor. If it comes to oak, you can take the European oak or French oak, or you can take American oak, different flavors again. Depending on how old uh, the cask is, it has an impact on how much oak flavor will be put into the cask. Mm -hmm. Depending on uh, which temperatures were used to build this cask, will affect the flavor. Depending on the yeast, and that's where our favorite ball game is, yeah. how can you create flavor through microbiology? The water uh, is also important. Most people are able to manipulate uh, the water ionic concentration, the water chemistry, basically. Uh, in Norway, we can do it. In Scotland, we can't. And each one of these is an like, aspect itself where you can actually create flavor. Today, we're doing a old school, traditional Scotch style recipe, which means 100% molten barley, heritage barley varieties. We've got Myris Otter. It's an old variety from the 60s. It's great for malting. It's great uh, for flavor. We, we know this by now because the, the last 50 years, uh, some of the beers that came out, blind tasting, um, people didn't know what it was, but um, won awards. Yeah. So Myris Otter is great. Uh, it's floor molten. The inefficiency through the floor molting process can lead to uh, different flavor profiles than when you put it in the uh, in the drum molting. It's good to be Benedict size. You could tell it was designed for Benedict to be able to do this. Because I'm a little shorter than this guy, and I'm over here on my tippy toes trying to fill this in. <laughs> Started off this morning, you got me working, earning my, earning my whiskey, uh, you know, loading up grains into the mash tun. Talk to me about uh, what we're doing. Well, thanks for breaking up the dough balls in there just now. <laughs> um, we've got about 30 uh, to 45 minutes now. Uh, the enzymes within uh, the grain, within that mash tun now, will break down uh, the starches into fermentable sugars. Um, as you know, we've got two main uh, enzymes. Uh, they're both working perfectly at the temperature that we've chosen now. Uh, within the next 30 minutes, um, they will do all the work. They will actually denature, they will die. So after 30 minutes, we don't have uh, much to do. Just linger around. Now that the 30 minutes are done, um, we are opening the bottom of it and we let it flow out where, with gravity. But we turn on the pump and we are recirculating. So the pump is just sucking from here, but this is being filled with gravity, and this way we're not running risk of uh, destroying the bed inside. We call it bed. It's a pile of grain which is sitting on a false bottom, and we're recirculating because the smaller particles that we see now, they will go in at the top again, they will start to sit on this bed, and they will actually uh, close up individual gaps. The filter effect will increase, and at some point in a few minutes, this will turn clear. And clear is important for us because all of these starchy particles, they create a nutty and malty character according to the Scots. Yeah. Clear words create fruity and non-nutty malty characters. And we're, we're all for fruit, so we'll wait until it's clear. So in there currently we've got about a thousand liters of um, extremely sugary wood. I mean, we'll taste it in a second, it's, it's very, very sweet. Huh? Uh, this is going through the heat exchanger. We cool it down to about 22 degrees. That's where the yeast is happy. We put it in the fermenter. this brewery and this yeast in particular? Well, you know, um, with my time uh, over at the Thompson Brothers at Dornick Distillery, I, I learned that there's nothing more valuable than having a befriended local craft brewery that actually uses uh, excellent yeast for their own productions and something that you can tap into. You know, most breweries after sixth or eighth generation, they just throw it down the drain, but in fact, they're still very uh, useful to us distillers. Mm -hmm. So going over and picking them up is just uh, excellent. And Graf in particular, apart from being like amazing people, yeah. uh, they use uh, this excellent yeast, this Boddington yeast that the brewery that went bust in the late 90s. 
and uh, a lot of craft brewers and home brewers out there agree that that uh, yeast is like excellent it produces this really nice gummery uh, english ale character that's exactly what we're hoping for uh, in whiskey as well especially the old school style scotch whiskey nice well guess what man let's go get some yeast buddy <laughs> this yourself is this something you cultivated yourself is this a domestic like what, what's where did this yeast come from yeah so it is uh, originally it is a british strain uh sourced from boddington's brewery which is closed down i don't know 10 15 years ago but we source it from imperial organic yeast in portland oregon actually on the west coast of the u.s so that's where we buy we buy a, a jug like a, containing eight liters of slurry and then we pitch it into our fermenters ferments the beer and then it, it grows of course during fermentation and then we can pitch two or three times four times more as much yeast as we pitched and then we keep keep that going for like eight generations and then we reculture from the lab okay and then what kind of beer styles do you guys use this yeast in and then what flavors does it yeah so you can essentially consider this to be our house yeast because we use it in almost every beer we make. We use it for all of our pale ales, IPAs, porters, or lower, lower alcohol British style beers, uh, because it gives a very nice and soft mouth feel, and also pretty estuary yeast, so it produces a lot of like nice tropical fruity aromas from that are fermentation derived. And that really adds complexity to our hoppy beers, our IPAs, double IPAs. Tropical flavors uh, in general, like, uh, some peachy and gummy, sort of also some like candy-ish flavors. Depends of course with fermentation temperatures and, and the strength of the wort and, and oxygen and those sort of parameters, but it's it's very rich. Like if you take the same wort and ferment it with an American ale yeast, it, you wouldn't even think it was the same beer to begin with. It is so different. It's Uh, basically, we're, we're transferring now from the mash tun through the heat exchanger into the wash bag where it will ferment. We are throwing in the wood from above yep. so that it gets some oxygen. Uh, the yeast, which we'll be adding uh, eventually, like within the, the next uh, 30 minutes. As long as there's oxygen in here, the yeast will multiply rather than ferment the ethanol that we want. But during this multiplication process, substances are being created that actually don't only benefit the yeast for health and adapt to the new uh, alcoholic environment, mm -hmm. but also produces uh, flavors that we actually want. The more you give this sugar to the reproduction part, the more flavorsome it can become, but also the less yield you'll get, the less ethanol. So you need to have a fine balance between not having too much and not having too little. Also taking into respect the cell count that we have, the more cells we throw in, the less oxygen you theoretically need, the less uh, yeast you throw in, the more oxygen you need. Yeah, yeah. you know, it, so. it's interesting. Again, we talk about, this, this episode is about recipe development and stuff. It's these little things right there which make the huge, whole difference. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Whole different, thing, whole different flavors. Yeah. But not just that, also the temperature. Uh, right now we, we went in very hot to sterilize everything. Mm -hmm. Now we have to go in cold to then balance out the temperature and we want to get it at like spot on 22 degrees. If it's too hot, the yeast is stressed. Yeah. When the yeast is unhappy, it produces uh, flavors that we don't want. Yeah. Um, these flavors in small amounts like diacetyl might be good for us because it creates a butterscotch flavor, but if you have too much of it, it starts to get too much of this popcorn buttery flavor, which you don't want either. So yeah. um, you don't need to have ingredients to create flavor. Yeah. You have to know and understand every step of the process to manipulate exactly the flavor you want. And that's the reason why you've got this massive spectrum of 
uh, for some the Scotch whiskey yeah. flavors, and they all only yeast, molten barley, yeast, and water, nothing else. Yeah. That's incredible. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. Perfect. 22, yeah, 22. Exactly what we want. Cool. So we've got 7.5 kilograms of yeast here. Um, it's about 1 billion cells per um, milliliter on thick slurry like this. We, there's a rough uh, formula which is 100 million cells per milliliter times the liters that you have times uh, the plato. So we are at about 15 plato, so it's basically 100, 100 million times uh, 1,500 times 15. And um, if we calculate all that, we are having more numbers than what we can count. Yeah. So the rough rule is a kilogram of slurry that has been harvested from the fermenter as we've done with craft mm -hmm. per hectoliter, which is 100 liters. We've got 1,500 liters. So 7.5 kilograms is pretty much half than what a brewery would usually pitch. But I like to under pitch because that means the yeast has to uh, replicate a little bit more. During this process, aroma is being created and we are sacrificing a little bit of ethanol for flavor. So this, this one will be now sitting for seven days. Okay. Yeah. So basically 48 hours primary fermentation uh, where the yeast turns sugar into alcohol and now we've got another five days of uh, lactobacillic uh, fermentation. I know I'm learning a lot, Benedict, about recipe development with you and especially yeast and everything that goes into uh, into all of that but I will tell you I am a I am a pro at this <laughs> this is one of the major things I learned working with distillers from all over the world man so the same thing <laughs> at every distillery yep. get in there get in there you got to clean it for the next batch <laughs> Smell that, that just smells funky. It's like, unfortunately. What are you looking for in here when you're trying that? Like, to make you know that everything's on track, you know, for the recipe that you're developing? Well, first thing I want straight up my nose is yeah. like an apple cider character, you know? Like, mm -hmm. you should smell the acidity. Yeah. You know it's acidic, we will taste it, it is acidic. Yeah. But we want this like strong, um, fruity, flavor because the yeasts inside there they are incredibly smart things yeah. you know the only reason they're producing these volatile acids that smell like fruit is to attract uh, fruit flies so that they can settle down and when the fruit flies fly somewhere else they hitch a right yeah hitch a right and uh, this way they travel yeah um, and fortunately because of that uh, a boring grain, even though this is not a boring grain, but any boring grain mm -hmm. can develop to incredible fruit yeah. flavors. So what we'll do now is we'll empty this one, shoot it into uh, the still, crack it up, and uh, hopefully in about six hours we'll uh, we'll go into tails, into yeah. the tail cut, and so the next few hours we'll cut our half. Nice. So we just finished up with, you know, talking about flavor from fermentation. And then once fermentation is done, you're then, we saw the transfer into the beautiful still here. And now we're talking about cut points. So talk to me about what's happening in distillation. All right. I mean, um, as you can see, uh, we've got the pot, mm -hmm. uh, the fermented wash or beer without any hops. Uh, it's being transferred into the pot. It's going to be heated up 
the vapor is going to be carried across uh, into the cooler. This is the condenser. So uh, the vapor turns back into liquid and drops out here. In here, we've got a mix of ethanol, other different alcohols, other volatile substances. Eventually, the, the good uh, components get carried across as, as the half. And uh, at some point, the longer chain alcohols or fusel oils uh, make their way through with a higher boiling point in here. And uh, these have a very low threshold when it comes to aroma, which means you only need a, a very small portion of these to have a massive effect on your, uh, on your discipline. But the, the new make gets its oiliness uh, and body from it. So you need to have some of them in there, but not too much. You just have to get the right spot depending on how long you want to mature it. It has a big impact as well because these longer chain alcohols, they will react with volatile acid to create esters. So if you do a very, very clean cut, you will mainly focus on these apple esters, these orchard fruit esters like pear as well. But if you want to have more tropical flavors, more gummy bear aromas, more tutti frutti, I call them, you know, you want some of that pineapple, that peach. For these, you need to have long chain alcohols, but for that you also need time. Which means, depending on how long you want to mature, you make your cut point accordingly. Yeah, so this is now a prime example of how faints smell. I mean, we, we've done the cut uh, before, a yeah. uh, long time ago, fortunately. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. You know, it's super interesting, because again, somebody that's like me, that's novice, that hasn't done this much, when we made those cut points that you just described, from heads to parts, you could definitely smell that nail polish. And then you could see that transition as you started to smell it being like, wow, that was a lot more fruitier. So for me, even not having this experience, what you're describing, it was fairly recognizable, you know, just using your senses. And just like this, when we made our cut points from hearts to, to tails, you immediately said like cardboard or, you know, musty and you smell it. And it was just like exactly that. So it's pretty interesting that uh, you'd be able to recognize those cut, cut points based off of, you know, using your senses like that. These are old Solera casks, you know, these big 500 liter casks. I found a producer down in South Spain that is recuperating them, rebuilding them into 250 liter casks and then replacing the ends with uh, new oak. So this is new, this is super old. I mean, these, these uh, staves, they can be you know, uh, 20, 30 years old, soaking in sherry for all this time. But uh, we are not the biggest fans of too much sherry flavor because it can impart the flavors that we are trying to um, generate through the fermentation process, these delicate aromas. So this is a refill cask. So it has been filled for four years with uh, Bifrost whiskey before, freshly emptied, and now we will fill ours. Don't be shy, it can handle something. Yeah, you can also like put it on the belly and just roll it down. I love it when you tell me, you're like, Jeff, go ahead and just roll it down. And then I do and watch it goes right through the glass of the distillery and you're, I'm just sitting here like, it'll make for a good episode, though, for sure. <laughs> well, I'm here to stop it if it goes. <laughs> no, <I know. laughs> I'm the, the bowling keg. <laughs> Take the gravity reading of our heart. Yeah. Uh, Diluted down to 63.5% alcohol. Uh, and then fill it in there. At higher ABVs, you more pronounce the oaky woody flavors. At lower ABVs, it's proven to uh, uh, extract more of these lactones and uh, sugars and vanilla characteristics. If you intend to mature for like, say 30 years plus, then maybe you want to go in at a higher percentage, like 70. Yeah. Um, but as we'll be storing this for maybe 10 years plus, 63.5 I think is quite a good strength. Um, if this would have been a very young sherry cask first filled, then I would probably go in with like 48 or 
50 just because um, it's almost virgin oak only touched by a low ABV uh, beverage such as like, the sherry that has been inside before um, so as this is like a second for now I think 63.5 is a good strength perfect yeah. All right. Why did you guys choose Aurora Distillery to create your recipe? One of uh, the most important aspects of uh, whiskey, I believe, is the maturation aspect. In order to put most emphasis on uh, the interactive reactions that happen uh, inside a cask, interactive reactions based on that that we have created during fermentation, you need time. And if you put something into a hot and dry uh, environment, not only is it going to extract a lot of flavor from the cask, and thus shortening the interactive maturation aspect, but also you lose a lot to the environment. Here in Norway, it's a little bit more extreme than Scotland, in the sense that it is humid and it's always cold. Thus, what is going to happen to a Scotch style whiskey within a warehouse like this. And not only that, it's just beautiful here. It has an amazing equipment and that warehouse just there's no better home for one of our casks, I would suppose. And of course, big thank you to our Royal Spirit, especially to Peter and Hans Olaf for uh, welcoming us here, allowing us to, to utilize the facilities. A distillery in this location, I was thinking Bergen, Oslo, even Tromso, and I'm like, why was this place so so appealing for you guys to build a distillery here? Well, the founders are from this area, and part of the reason they found this distillery was to bring jobs to the area. They visited Scotland for different reasons, and they saw this really cool industry called whiskey. One of the founders, he was actually working in tourism, and he was looking at how can we improve the quality level of tourism in Norway, because tourism in Norway is still developing. Went to Scotland and realized, well, tourism in Scotland is whiskey. And, and he was like, hey, there, there's a few similarities between Scotland and Norway, uh, and northern Norway in particular, the mountains, the nature, the water. But most importantly, it's the kind of business or industry that you don't need to be close to a big city to succeed. I would say almost in whiskey is the opposite. The more remote, the more exotic your location, the better. They just saw this as a really good combination of bringing jobs back to their local area and also doing something different, doing something interesting, and, and we have some things going on here. I ran and jumped at the, the chance to film this episode, this collaboration between you and Spirit Spirits, yeah. because I know there's some funky, cool, wild innovation going on in whiskey, you know, but how did you guys develop this partnership? So I think it's, it's a great partnership. They bring in innovation, they bring in the crazy ideas, we help facilitate and, and be part of that. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a good collaborative uh, project altogether. We're super stoked to be part of it, for sure. And, and I'm excited to see how some of these things are turning out, because at this point it's mostly you make, but uh, there's some interesting stuff in the making. Norway has such a young whiskey industry, like the industry hasn't really developed and so getting, getting that knowledge in the country is basically impossible. We got to go abroad to get it, the best people. At the same time, it's also, we have local people employed and it's, it's about transferring that knowledge over to the locals and, and allowing the organization, also the industry to grow in that it is a local thing, but it's also like very much a global, global thing, isn't it? Thank you guys so much for the hospitality. I learned so much from you guys and uh, I'm excited to just follow your guys' journey moving forward.
on the amazing spirits you guys create. Skull. Skull. Oh, too, man.